Jesus, when he takes off his outer garment and wraps it around himself and gets down on his knees and starts washing their feet, it would have been, I mean, look, they have seen Jesus raise people from the dead. They've seen him open blinded eyes. They've seen him heal a paralytic. This might be the most shocking thing that the disciples ever saw Jesus do. Wow. One specific Super Bowl commercial kind of set the world ablaze. Everyone was talking about the commercial from the nonprofit He Gets Us. Now, the stated goal of this is to get people to start having conversations about Jesus. They want people to begin seeing Jesus in a different light than they typically see him. And so let's look at one of the two commercials that they spent about $17 million putting out, and it depicts AI images, which are always kind of creepy to me, but nevertheless, AI images of unlikely people washing each other's feet. Let's take a look. Police officer washing maybe a criminal a preppy girl with a punk rocker, a cowboy with a Native American, a woman with a young lady at a Planned Parenthood. Maybe a grandma and granddaughter, an oil worker with maybe an immigrant. A Muslim woman having her feet washed. An older black man, an older white man, look like they're in the South. Uh, a guy who I think is obviously gay with a priest. Okay, so if you're just listening, number one, get over to YouTube. It's a better experience. But it ends, after all of these images of unlikely people washing feet, it ends with Jesus didn't teach hate. He washed feet. Okay, so that's the point. And it's art. In a large sense, it's, it's marketing, but it's art. And it is supposed to elicit some kind of reaction. And boy, did it! <laughs> They got what they were looking for, I guess, uh, because people, you'll never guess this, that uh, the people who are on the right and the people who are on the left and the people who are Christians and the people who are non-Christians, guess what? They're all mad. Wow. So uh, the people who are Christians, a lot of them saw this, um, especially people who maybe are like lean more conservative in their Christianity. They saw this and they thought, hey, yeah. Jesus came and loved people. Also, he never condoned sin. And so some of the things that it seems to be showing, it's art and it's AI art, so it's even harder to decipher. But it seems like we're serving someone in some kind of sin, but we're not saying anything about it. So some people had ideas like, do the same images, but then throw in the tagline from John 8, where Jesus sees the woman caught in adultery, and he says, I don't condemn you, but go and sin no more. Right. And so just put that tagline on there and then it will all be fixed. And, and it's like, it's this neutered Christianity. Um, Jesus is the same God who rained down fire on Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, like uh, they're just uh, defemonstrating us. Like, I mean, you know, whatever word that even means. So, okay. Then the non-Christian side have looked into some of the backers who put the millions and millions and millions of dollars into this nonprofit in order to make the commercials. And they have found that it's some people like the founder of Hobby Lobby who really fought against Obamacare because it was going to force him to allow some of his employees access to certain forms of birth control and maybe even, even abortion that he couldn't stand by, that he's been on the other side of some LGBTQ issues uh, where he has been against them and even helped fund uh, different political uh, you know, bills and things like that that were against him. So they're like, hey, 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 no, 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 no. This is too conservative. And then for a lot of the Christians, they're like, hey, this is too liberal. And it's just the oppressor, oppressor. So here's where I think we should go. I think we should go to John chapter 13.
And we should look at what actually happened when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. And what I want to do is I want to make a theological point that is going to kind of maybe seem to line up on one side of this argument. And then I want to make a broader scriptural application that may seem to kind of line up a little bit more on the other side. Um, And that's what scripture does, right? That's why we have this podcast, because it brings us out of our echo chambers and into a nuanced position in the middle. How much fun would that be? All right. So let's look at John chapter 13. It says, now, when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the father had given everything into his hands, that he had come from God, and that he was going back to God. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, and tied it around himself. Next, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel tied around him. Now, this is crazy. So, we can't really understand in our cultural context what this means. Uh, back then, they there were servants, and most of this was indentured servitude, and that is who would wash the feet of the people who came into a house. They wore sandals. There was no paved roads. Everything was dusty. You didn't want to bring the dust inside. So usually, there was some kind of servant there, and if there wasn't a servant, this is the way this the social hierarchy worked, then the woman of the house would perform that duty, but never a man, and never the leader, and never, ever, ever a rabbi, right? And so we have Jesus, who is not a servant, and who is not a woman, and who is the rabbi. He's the leader of the entire group. And apparently, you know, they didn't travel with with servants, and he's just eating with his 12 disciples, so it's all men there, and none of the disciples are willing to wash the other disciples' feet. Interestingly, this happens in close proximity to the mother of James and John coming and saying, I want my sons to sit on your left and your right, and Jesus having to teach them about how they're not using power to lord it over others. They're not going to live to desire power and position like everyone does in our world and, and like they were doing back then. And so Jesus, when he takes off his outer garment and wraps it around himself and gets down on his knees and starts washing their feet, it would have been, I mean, look, they have seen Jesus raise people from the dead. They've seen him open blinded eyes. They've seen him heal a paralytic. This might be the most shocking thing that the disciples ever saw Jesus do. Wow. That's how culturally crazy it was. All right, let's get back into chapter 13. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, what I'm doing, you don't realize now, but later you will understand. And Peter said, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus replied, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Now that is language in the ancient context that is about inheritance. It is about the promise of these men who were following Jesus having a role in the eternal kingdom of God. This is a significant threat from Jesus. If you're not going to let me cleanse you, then you're giving up your inheritance. If you're not going to let me cleanse you, then you have no part with me. You have no future with me. And so Peter freaks out. In verse 9, Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but wash my hands and my head, give me a whole bath, throw me in the shower, let's let's do a steam, like scrub me down, like let's do all of it, man. He really freaks out. And Jesus says this, one who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you, for he knew who would betray him. And this is why he said, not all of you are clean. Now, Jesus goes on and gives the meaning When they had washed their feet and put on their clothing, he reclined and said, do you know what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're speaking rightly since that's what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's. For I've given you an example that you should also do just as I have done for you. Jesus, uh, several verses later, is going to make this really clear. This isn't just about washing each other's feet. He's going to give a new command after Judas has left the room. When Judas had left, Jesus said, the son of man is glorified and God is glorified in him. And if God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself. So little children, I'm with you a little while longer. You'll look for me. And just as I told the Jews where I'm going, you cannot come. And so I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. Check this out. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Okay, so we can look into the history of the early church, and we can look into the writings of the patristic church fathers, and what we see is 
almost everyone understood that washing each other's feet was not a sacrament. It's not like the Lord's Supper. It's not like baptism. That Jesus was setting an incredible example of how believers should interact in humility with one another. Now, there's a key word in what I just said, which is how believers should interact with one another. And what Jesus does is he takes his disciples and he calls out the one who is going to betray him and he washes their feet. And he has this conversation with Peter and he goes, Peter, you're already cleansed. You just need your feet to be washed. And this is a distinction that matters theologically. Those in a relationship with Jesus need a washing. Those out of a relationship need to be cleansed. And so what this means practically is those who have already believed in Jesus, um, you have relational, positional forgiveness. Like your eternity is secure. You've become a child of God. You've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. At the same time, to maintain your relationship and to maintain your eternal inheritance, you need to continually allow God to wash you. You do this through confession. You do this uh, through worship. You do this through spending time in his word. You do this through meditating on him. Those who do not know Jesus need more than their feet washed. They need to be cleansed. This is what John, the same John who wrote this, wrote in his letter to the church he was helping to lead. He says, if we confess our sins, then Jesus is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you don't know Christ, you need more than a washing. You need to be cleansed from top to bottom. You need your sins taken care of in order to change your position from a dead man to someone who is alive in Christ, from someone who is spiritually dead to a new creation. And so Jesus looks at Peter in John's presence at the Last Supper and says, you're already cleansed. You don't need a full bath, man. Just let me wash your feet. Let me keep restoring you. Let me serve you in this way so you can continue to have a part in me. This is a theological distinction that matters. What does this have to do with the Super Bowl ad? Well, the call understood uh, throughout the first several centuries of the church based on what happened in John 13 is that the call to wash feet is from believer to believer. As a matter of fact, in first or second Timothy, it's talking about taking care of the widows and the widows having excellent character. And one of the ways it describes a widow of excellent character is that she does all of these things to take care of her community, including washing the feet of the saints. And so this is a call to Christian community. Jesus said, a new command I give you that you love one another. This is how they will know you're my disciples. If as disciples, disciples love each other. So the idea of taking the washing of the feet that Jesus did and applying it to people, it's art, it's subjective, but who I'm guessing their point is are out of relationship with God, who do not believe in God, is a big stretch theologically of John 13, but it's art. So what is it actually trying to, to get across? And what did Jesus washing feet really teach us. We have this incredible parallel in the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippians where he actually uses the imagery of what happened that night of Jesus taking out his taking off his outer garment which would have signified that he was the teacher, he was the master, he was in charge, taking it off in order to get down low and wash the feet of his disciples. Check this out in Philippians chapter 2. It says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. He got low, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And it's for this reason that God highly exalted him and gave him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven on, on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. Jesus emptied himself. He, he took off all of his heavenly garments and came down and lived in our brokenness and our poverty. Here's the bigger picture. If we are to follow Jesus, we will approach the world with humility while never sacrificing the truth. We will approach the world with humility 
while never sacrificing truth. That's how Jesus lived. Here's what I think about the images of, you know, the priest washing the feet of a guy that they went out of their way to try and signal to us was a member of the LGBTQ community, right? Um, I think there is an inherent, an, an inherent cringe that could have actually been the catalyst for both sides to be so offended by this. And here's why. Washing someone's feet, Jesus said, just as the, the, just as the teacher does this, so you as the servant should do this, right? Live in humility. What he's actually trying to get us to do is to live a humble life and to love other people well. And there's few things that would be more showy and more like, look at me, than just hanging out and starting to wash other people's feet. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm jaded. Tell me in the comments. I just need prayer or something. That's fine. Wow. But I think that in today's culture, this would be received, especially if you had someone photographing it, as like, look how spiritual I am. And that puts you into the potential problem of the Pharisees who did very spiritual seeming things without an actual heart of humility behind them. And so what does it look like to humble ourselves in a culture, especially in the West, that is becoming more and more antithetical to the call of Christ and more and more oppositional, and in some cases, even militant against what the scripture teaches. Well, here's how Paul viewed his ministry. Uh, I love this, this kind of summation of how he viewed the work that he was called to do. Although I am free from all and not any one slave, I've made myself a slave to everyone to win more people. Paul, who are you a slave to? Everyone. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law, though I myself am not even under the law. I want to win those who are. To those who are without the law, I lived like one without the law, though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ. I did it to win those who don't have the law. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I've become all things to all people so that I may by every possible means save some. Why do you do that? Verse 23. Now I do all this because of the gospel so that I may share in their blessings. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul is laying out in detail an attitude that at Metachurch, where I'm the pastor, we call whatever it takes. We do whatever it takes to get people to Jesus. And so look, for those who are Christians and you hated this commercial and it made you uncomfortable and you think it's just trying to reinforce, you know, cultural ideas that are against Christianity and it, it just makes Christians seem like we're always the bad guys and it just gives into the oppressor oppressed narrative and it's super cringy and the AI images make you uncomfortable, you know, all, all the things like I, I do think I see where you're coming from. However, what's our first goal is our first goal to win is our first goal to make sure that every nonprofit that is trying to start conversations about Jesus has perfect theology, is our first goal to get our politician into the White House, is our first goal to score societal points. Because if those are our first goals, it puts us in opposition to Jesus. We should take on the character of Paul, who says, I will become all things to all people so that by every possible means, I might save some. I think if I showed up with a bucket and a towel and started washing random people's feet, they'd be weirded out and it might seem like I was seeking my own attention. However, if you could convince me that I could win people to an understanding and belief in Christ by doing that, I would be interested in doing it. We should be called to do whatever it takes. And so as we're having these conversations, are we being helpful? Um, even your commentary on Christian commercials is a part of whether you are shining your light or hiding your light. And so it doesn't mean we can't critique things. It doesn't mean we can't help people have a little bit better theology or present things in better ways. But if you are not creative enough or intelligent enough to figure out ways to approach that, that still seem loving, then you maybe need to put a little bit more work and a little bit more effort into your contributions. You may need to take a little more time and not fall into the social media trap of having to be the first one to say something about everything. And we just maybe need to check our heart and make sure that our first intention is to say, you know, the people represented in that video, whether they are immigrants who are coming illegally, whether, which I've, I've talked uh, 
a lot about on the podcast. We can talk about those policies. We can talk about those things, whether it's someone who's in the LGBTQ community and is not in relationship with Jesus, whether it is someone who is uh, preparing to have an abortion, whoever it is, if our first goal isn't for those people who do really exist in our world to come to know and believe in Jesus, then our priorities are simply out of line. If you enjoyed this clip, make sure you check out the full podcast and subscribe and hit the notification bell to stay up to date with all new content. You can also support the channel at patreon.com slash Clayton Tyner. Link is in the description below.